Chapter Six of Through the Looking Glass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Chapter Six. Humpty Dumpty. However, the egg got only larger and larger and more and more human. When she had come within a few yards of it, she saw that it had eyes and a mouth and a nose and when she had come close to it she saw very clearly that it was humpty dumpty himself it can't be anybody else she said to herself i am as certain of it as if his name were written all over his face it might have been written a hundred times easily on that enormous face humpty dumpty was sitting with his legs crossed like a turk on the top of a high wall such a narrow one that alice quite wondered how he could keep his balance and as his eyes were steadily fixed in the opposite direction and he didn't take the least notice of her she thought he must be a stuffed figure after all and how exactly like an egg he is she said aloud standing with her hands ready to catch him for she was every moment expecting him to fall it is very provoking humpty dumpty said after a long silence looking away from alice as he spoke to be called an egg very i said you looked like an egg sir alice gently explained and some eggs are very pretty you know she added hoping to turn her remark into a sort of compliment some people said humpty dumpty looking away from her as usual have no more sense than a baby alice didn't know what to say to this and it wasn't at all like conversation she thought and as he never said anything to her in fact his last remark was evidently addressed to a tree so she stood and softly repeated to herself humpty dumpty sat on a wall humpty dumpty had a great fall and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put humpty dumpty in his place again that last line is much too long for the poetry she added almost out loud forgetting that humpty dumpty could hear her don't stand there chatting to yourself like that humpty dumpty said looking at her for the first time but tell me your name and your business my name is alice but it's a stupid enough name humpty dumpty interrupted impatiently what does it mean must the name mean something alice asked doubtfully of course it must humpty dumpty said with a short laugh my name means the shape i am a good and handsome shape it is too with a name like yours you might be any shape almost why do you sit out there all alone said alice not wishing to begin an argument why because there is nobody with me cried humpty dumpty did you think i didn't know the answer to that ask me another don't you think you'd be safer down on the ground alice went on not with any idea of making another riddle but simply in her good-natured anxiety for the queer creature that wall is so very narrow what tremendously easy riddles you ask humpty dumpty crawled out of course i don't think so why if i ever did fall off which there's no chance of but if i did here he pursed his lips and looked so solemn and grand that alice could hardly help laughing if i did fall he went on the king has promised me with his very own mouth to 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 send all his horses and all his men alice interrupted rather unwisely now i declare that's too bad humpty dumpty cried breaking with sudden passion you have been listening at doors and behind trees and down chimneys or you couldn't have known it i haven't indeed alice said very gently it's in a book ah well they may write such things in a book humpty dumpty said in a calmer tone that's what you call a history of england that is now take a good look at me i am the one that has spoken to a king i am mayhap you will never see such another and to show you i am not proud you may shake hands with me and he grinned almost from ear to ear as he leant forwards and as nearly as possible fell off the wall in doing so and offered alice his hand she watched him a little anxiously as she took it if he smiled much more the ends of his mouth might meet behind she thought and then i don't know what would happen to his head i am afraid it would come off yes all his horses and all his men humpty dumpty went on they'd pick me up again in a minute they would however this conversation is going a little too fast let's go back to the last remark but one i am afraid i can't quite remember it i listed very politely in that case we start fresh said humpty dumpty and it's my turn to choose a subject he talks about it just as if it was a game thought alice so here's a question for you how old did you say you were alice made a short calculation and said seven years and six months wrong humpty dumpty exclaimed triumphantly you never said a word like it i thought you meant how old are you alice explained if i'd meant that i'd have said it said humpty dumpty 
Alice didn't want to begin another argument, so she said nothing. Seven years and six months, Humpty Dumpty repeated thoughtfully, an uncomfortable sort of age. Now, if you'd asked my advice, I'd have said, leave off at seven, but it's too late now. I never ask advice about growing, Alice said indignantly. Too proud? the other inquired. Alice felt even more indignant at this suggestion. I mean, she said, that one can't help growing older. One can't, perhaps, said Humpty Dumpty, but two can. With proper assistance, you might have left off at seven. What a beautiful belt you've got on, Alice suddenly remarked. They had had quite enough of the subject of age, she thought, and if they really were to take turns in choosing subjects, it was her turn now. At least she corrected herself on second thoughts. A beautiful cravat, I should have said. No, a belt. I mean, I beg your pardon, she added in dismay, for Humpty Dumpty looked thoroughly offended, and she began to wish she hadn't chosen that subject. If I only knew, she thought to herself, which was neck and which was waist. Evidently Humpty Dumpty was very angry, though he said nothing for a minute or two. When he did speak again, it was in a deep growl. It is a most provoking thing, he said at last, when a person doesn't know a cravat from a belt. I know it's very ignorant of me, Alice said in so humble a tone that Humpty Dumpty relented. It's a cravat, child, and a beautiful one, as you say. It's a present from the white king and queen. There now. Is it really? said Alice quite pleased to find that she had chosen a good subject after all. They gave it to me, Humpty Dumpty continued thoughtfully, as he crossed one knee over the other and clasped his hands round it. They gave it to me, for an unbirthday present. I beg your pardon, Alice said with a puzzled air. I am not offended, said Humpty Dumpty. I mean, what is an unbirthday present? A present given, when it isn't your birthday, of course. Alice considered a little. I like birthday presents best, she said at last. "'You don't know what you are talking about,' cried Humpty Dumpty. "'How many days are there in a year?' Three hundred and sixty-five, said Alice. "'And how many birthdays have you?' "'One. "'And if you take one from three hundred and sixty-five, what remains?' Three hundred and sixty-four, of course.' Humpty Dumpty looked doubtful. "'I rather see that done on paper,' he said. Alice couldn't help smiling as she took out a memorandum book and worked the sum for him. Humpty Dumpty took the book and looked at it carefully. "'That seems to be done right,' he began. "'You're holding it upside down,' Alice interrupted. "'To be sure I was,' Humpty Dumpty said gaily, as she turned it round for him. "'I thought it looked a little queer. As I was saying, that seems to be done right, though I haven't time to look it over thoroughly just now, and that shows that there are three hundred and sixty-four days when you might get unbirthday presents.' "'Certainly,' said Alice. And only one for birthday presents, you know. There's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory, said Alice. Humpty Dumpty smiled contemptuously. Of course you don't, till I tell you. I meant, there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument, Alice objected. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is the master? That's all. Alice was too much puzzled to say anything, so after a minute Humpty Dumpty began again. They have a temper, some of them, particularly verbs. They are the proudest. Adjectives you can do anything with, but not verbs. However, I can manage the whole lot of them. Impenetrability, that's what I say. Would you tell me, please, said Alice, what that means? Now you talk like a reasonable child, said Humpty Dumpty, very much pleased. I meant by impenetrability that we've had enough of that subject, and it would be just as well if you'd mention what you mean to do next, as I suppose you don't mean to stop here all the rest of your life. That's a great deal to make one word mean, Alice said in a thoughtful tone. When I make a word do a lot of work like that, said Humpty Dumpty, I always pay it extra. Oh, said Alice, she was much puzzled to make any other remark. Ah, uh, you should see him come round me of a Saturday night, Humpty Dumpty went on, wagging his head gravely from side to side, for to get their wages, you know. Alice didn't venture to ask what he paid them with, and so, you see, I can't tell you. You seem very clear at explaining words, sir, said Alice. Would you kindly tell me the meaning of the poem called Jabberwocky? Let's hear it, said Humpty Dumpty. I can explain all poems that were ever invented, and a good many that haven't been invented just yet. This sounded very hopeful, so Alice repeated the first verse. 
twas brilling at the slicey toffs did cry and gimble in the vape while mimsy were the borogoffs and the momres out grape that's enough to begin with humpty dumpty interrupted there are plenty of hard words there brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon the time when you begin broiling things for dinner that'll do very well said alice and slicey well slicely means slice and slimy light is the same as active you see it's like a portmanteau there are two meanings packed into one word i see it now alice remarked thoughtfully and what are toffs well toffs are something like badgers they are something like lizards and they are something like corkscrews they must be very curious looking creatures they are dead said humpty dumpty also they make their nests under sundials also they live on cheese and what's cryer and to gimble to cryer is to go round and round like a cryoscope to gimble is to make holes like a gimlet and the vape is the grass plot around the sundial i suppose said alice surprised at her own ingenuity of course it is it's called vape you know because it goes a long way before it and a long way behind it and a long way beyond it on each side alice added exactly so well then mimsy is flimsy and miserable there's another portmanteau for you and a borogoff is a thin shabby looking bird with its feathers sticking all around something like a live mop and what a mom has, said alice i'm afraid i'm giving you a great deal of trouble well a rest is a sort of green pig but mom i'm not certain about i think it's short for from home meaning that they lost their way you know and what does out grape mean well out grabing is something between bellowing and whistling with a kind of sneeze in the middle however you will hear it done maybe down in the wood yonder and when you have heard it once you will be quite content who has been repeating all that hard stuff to you i read it in a book said alice but i had some poetry repeated to me much easier than that by twiddledy i think it was as to poetry you know said humpty dumpty stretching out one of his great hands i can repeat poetry as well as other folk if it comes to that oh it needn't come to that alice hastily said hoping to keep him from beginning the piece i am going to repeat he went on without noticing her remark was written entirely for your amusement alice felt that in that case she ought to listen to it so she sat down and said thank you rather sadly in winter when the fields are white i sing this song for your delight only i don't sing it he added as an explanation i see you don't said alice if you can see whether i am singing or not you have sharper eyes the most humpty dumpty remarked severely alice was silent in spring when woods are getting green i'll try and tell you what i mean thank you very much said alice in summer when the days are long perhaps you'll understand the song in autumn when the leaves are brown take pen and ink and write it down i will if i can remember it so long said alice you needn't go on making remarks like that humpty dumpty said they are not sensible and they put me out i sent a message to the fish i told him that is what i wish the little fishes of the sea they sent an answer back to me the little fish's answer was we cannot do it sir because i am afraid i don't quite understand said alice it gets easier further on humpty dumpty replied i sent to them again to say it will be better to obey the fishes answered with a grin why what a temper you are in i told them once i told them twice they would not listen to it twice i took a kettle large and new fit for the deed i had to do my heart went hop my heart went thump i filled the kettle at the pump then someone came to me and said the little fishes are in bed i said to him i said it plain then you must wake them up again i said it very loud and clear i went and shouted in his ear humpty dumpty raised his voice almost to a scream as he repeated the verse and alice thought with a shudder i wouldn't have been the messenger for anything but he was very stiff and proud he said you needn't shout so loud and he was very proud and stiff he said i'd go and wake them if i took a corkscrew from the shelf and went to wake them up myself and when i found the door was locked i pulled and pushed and kicked and knocked and when i found the door was shut i tried to turn the handle but there was a long pause is that all alice timidly asked that's all said humpty dumpty good-bye this was rather sudden alice thought but after such a very strong hint that she ought to be going she felt that it would hardly be civil to stay so she got up and held out her hand good-bye till we meet again she said as cheerfully as she could i shouldn't know you again if we did meet humpty dumpty replied with a discontented tone giving her one of his fingers to shake you are so exactly like other people 
the face is what one goes by generally alice remarked in a thoughtful tone that's just what i complain of said humpty dumpty your face is the same as everybody has the two eyes so marking their places in the air with his thumb the nose in the middle the mouth under it's always the same now if you had two eyes on the same side of your nose for instance or the mouth at the top that would be some help it wouldn't look nice alice objected but humpty dumpty only shut his eyes and said wait till you have tried alice waited a minute to see if he would speak again but as he never opened his eyes or took any further notice of her she said good-bye once more and getting no answer to this she quietly walked away but she couldn't help saying to herself as she went oh all the unsatisfactory she repeated this aloud as it was a great comfort to have such a long word to say of all the unsatisfactory people i ever met she never finished the sentence for at this moment a heavy crash shook the forest from end to end End of chapter 6 Recording by Ellie July 2009